Founder Friday series, where we sit down with Div Inc. portfolio founders and alumni and talk about what they're up to these days and talk about everything from entrepreneurship and industry trends to work-life balance and wellness. Today, I'm super, super excited to be able to talk with Sumeda Ganju, who's the founder of Quimby and is also one of our Social Justice Tech Accelerator alumni. We are going to get into everything related to Quimby updates and all things mental health and emotional resilience. But before we get into the juicy stuff, Sumeda, I want you to just take a second to introduce yourself and tell us your founder story. I love hearing it every time, and I really want people who aren't familiar with you or with Quimby to hear your story. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Naisha, over here. Always a pleasure to talk to my Diving family. So you asked for my founder story. Just a little bit about me, background. Um, I'm, I have a master's in computer science, so very much an engineer by education. I have 10 plus years of product management experience, and then now 10,000 hours of mindfulness training. Uh, but that didn't just happen overnight. Um, a few years back, I was told I was depressed. And as an engineer, like logic, I am really good at, but emotions, not so much. So I was high performing. I was socializing with my friends. I really thought I was doing good. But then I had these episodes of breaking down in the parking lot of Walmart. And I couldn't understand it. I didn't know that's what depression is supposed to look like. I thought it's supposed to look like I'm not going to be able to perform at my job. I'm not going to be able to socialize with my friends. And for me, that's not how it looked like. So, and I didn't feel comfortable sharing it as well because there's so much stigma around it. Right. So that's how my journey started. I got into mindfulness and I learned like, oh, emotions can be trained. I got this. Like, I, you know, I can get training and I get logic. So that's how my journey started on mindfulness. And I've been volunteering, coaching people, as well as now with Mindful Use of Technology, first my first business, and now with Quimby, helping people, especially in companies, first normalize emotions and know that it's okay. It's okay to not feel okay. Mm -hmm. We just went through a pandemic. Um, <laughs> we're not okay. It's okay. That's okay to not feel okay. And then second, learn how do we use mindfulness to um, be more present and then to train the emotions that we want. Absolutely. And I know that uh, Quimby focuses on creating psychologically safe workplace environments. Um, can you tell us what psychologi psychological safety is and, and what that means in the context of a work environment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very simple if you really bring it down to a human level. Yeah. When we're learning, we make mistakes. Right. We learn best when we're allowed to fail, when we're allowed to like think about being a kid. And then every time if you had to mince your words, if you had to think about, is this going to be right? It's really hard to learn and progress fast. Mm -hmm. And that's what psychological safety is. Do I have an environment around me where it's conducive for me to learn really fast because I'm sharing my ideas openly and know that I'm not being judged for those ideas? Mm -hmm. I know that people have my back, that I can trust them. And I don't have to watch out for like, oh, is it somebody going to, again, judge me? Is there going to be a repercussion for this? And then I can form half-formed thoughts. And that's also important. Um, having to think through everything and then formalizing a very concrete, that's really good for certain um, times in your life. But then when you're ideating, you're brainstorming, you want to be able to get those half-formed thoughts out. Yeah. That's where psychological safety is, like no judgment, n like an ability to have trust with your coworkers, and then this environment where you can get half-formed ideas out. Yeah. Thank you for breaking that. <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for breaking that down. Um, I can see how that concept is super applicable, especially in the startup context where failing fast is kind of the motto and being able to collaborate and, and move quickly and testing ideas out and knowing that a lot of them are going to fail. Like that's a big part of the process. Right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I, I love that your, your background is like all these years of being an engineer and working in product. And um, were you working in a corporate context? Yes. Okay. So can you talk about the, the shift that you made from working in that corporate 
context, full time. So working full time with Quimby, what was that shift like? And what was the the mindset shift that you had to make? Or what were some of the challenges that you had to work through as you're building this company around mindfulness and emotional resilience? Yeah, absolutely. It was hard. It still (laughs) is. I I want to acknowledge that for everybody who's out there and going through it. Um, And I don't say it as it was hard as like, that it's not something that we can do. I wouldn't do it any other way. Totally worth it. But it was it took a second, it took a little bit of adjustment, and it still is something that I'm refining over time. So first and foremost, whole life, go to school, then go to corporates, there's a structure that is provided. When I actually left my full time, um, luckily for me, I had like Devink, and I got into a curriculum. So kind of gave me like, initially, that was really good for me, because then I got into a, um, a very structured way of going through my days. But when Devink ended, I really was like, how do I structure my days? I really can structure them however I want. And then you'll find days just go by and then you haven't done as much because there's not somebody account you're accountable to. And then there are days where you're working really, really late night because it's your own startup and you deeply care about it. More of these days happen than the other, which then leads to burnout. Right. So there, there, you have to find that balance. Um, for me, luckily, I have certain practices in place already. They're my non-negotiables. Um, I actually s- negotiated on them a few times, but I could see the impact right away in course correct. So like I get my meditations in regularly. Um, some level of physical activity is good. My family time is important for me. So um, I track it. I'm a, again, a tracker. So I <laughs> for tracking my mental health yeah and I will see over time that like I'm trending low even though I'm going up like I'll, I would have a high because I sold you know um, I talked to a customer sold a new pilot and then like days of lows and then a high but overall it's trending low mm-hmm. um, when I started doing that I was able to course correct then I saw my lows were not as low and I before I would get like I'm like oh I've been working late at night okay need to course correct so I think a lot of it was getting structure in place and making sure that what am I accounting for my day? Like which hours are like, this is what I'm going to do, get my work done. For me, I work best when I'm outside. So I go to a coffee shop a lot of times to work. Um, Second is like the few things that are key. I had to identify that. I wrote a list of 10 things and I went, I'm not going to be able to do all these 10 things. So instead of having this feeling of I'm missing out on life, I said, what are the two things that I'm not willing to miss out on? Mm-hmm. family and like my meditations came up very top so I'm like okay I need to design for that and I have to accept that some of the other things are going to um, become a lower priority like socializing traveling some of those things did drop off a little bit and then so accepting that was a big part of it too that I mean that sounds like something that I need to do because I think I mean I'm an entrepreneur. I have a small business in addition to working with Div Inc. And I think that, I think humans in general, we just have a hard time acknowledging our capacity and understanding that there's only so much we can do in a day, a week, a month, a year. And we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to to do all the things and have this, you know, amazing work-life balance where everything is being treated equally and we're thriving in all areas of our life. And that is unfortunately not the reality for a lot of us. And we have to be really um, intentional and uh, like very myopic on what we choose to prioritize, right? And I love the your tip of outlining those top 10 things and then getting more and more narrow and focused on what is important. Um, That kind of leads into my next question of any tips, tricks, uh, tools, or resources um, outside of Quimby, of course, that have helped you strike the balance that feels good for you as an entrepreneur. So if there's been any... um, I know you have your meditation practice and you've been using Quimby to track your um, wellness, but do you like, are there any books or podcasts or or things that you've watched that really helped adjust your mindset as you are navigating the difficulty of 
work-life balance as an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, so meditation is one. Oh, I'll start with intention. I don't think it's a one size fits all. I think you have to identify, as I said, if you're a parent, your intention would be very different than if you um, maybe just recently got married or if you're a younger person. So you, I think it starts with intention, identifying that, and then finding practices that help you meet that intention. Yeah. For me, the intentions that I have in place for my both my spiritual practices and the things that are important to me, meditation is a really big one. There's a lot of tools out there for meditation now. Yeah. One of the first books I had read, I'll give a shout out to my mentor as well as Inner Matrix Systems. They um, have trainings and curriculum. I was a part of that for four to five years and I learned a lot of my meditative practices from that. But there's a lot of apps out there like Insight Timer, Calm, Headspace that have good, really good meditation practices to even just get 10 to 15, 20 minutes in. So I would say that. As for reading goes, um, again, beyond that inner matrix systems there's a lot of books like power of now is a really yeah. good well, one of my favorites yeah uh, you're not your mind or you're not your brain one of those was the first one where i read about the concept of neuroplasticity and i started learning that you can change your thoughts you can change your mind um, and go above that and beyond that so just constantly reading that with an intention has been helpful uh, one of the biggest ones for me is disconnecting Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were mindful use of technology before this. Yeah. We're giving input to our brain. Like if you think of us, our brain as a machine and you think of it as not you, but as a separate machine, you're constantly giving it input. So I'm not big into, I'm big into audio books kind of, but not so much into podcasts. And one of the reasons is I'm always consuming information Yeah. and I feel whether it's emails, whether it's, you know, um, audio books, whether my brain has to process that information. And then there is a the result, which is the thoughts and everything else. At some point, I got to let my brain rest. So I'm disconnecting as well. I'll take, if I really am feeling that way, I'll take a weekend uh, where I am completely disconnected. No phone, no laptops, no social media, no TV. Um, and I'll disconnect from internet and um, do silence days as well sometimes where I don't talk because then... It's even further, like my brain is like, I got nothing to say. You got to quiet down. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll not talk for a day. Those those are things like that really work well for me. Yeah, that that is something that I want to incorporate more into my my day to day um, and nature, being able to get outside more and you in that as the opportunity to discount. For me, running also really helps just yeah. getting into my physical body and turning off my thinking brain. Um, but, you know, it's a practice. I, of course, I have so much to learn and you, it sounds like. Um, I wanted to talk. I also want to acknowledge something that yeah. we, I, we work with a psychologist and we talk about this a lot. There's this concept of toxic positivity where uh, we talk about it. Okay. <laughs> what did you say? I didn't catch that. Sorry. I said, yes, please talk about that. Okay. Um, so it's a new concept to me too. Like I'm learning about it, but toxic positivity is where like we get this messaging all the time and we've got this men don't cry. Women don't yell. Right. Um, we don't express our emotions. We're not, we're told not to express our emotions. And there's right. a reasoning for that because a lot of times we don't distinguish between emotions and actions and we don't realize that emotions are just chemicals to our body. And by suppressing it, we're actually having side effects of that and expressing it can be different than actions. But irrespective of that, whatever the social conditioning has been, has been be optimistic, you know, it's going to be okay. Even if somebody asks us like, how are you doing? And we're struggling, we're like, I'm good, I'm okay. <laughs> or God forbid, if we say like, you know what? I'm really stressed. We'll follow it up with like, but things are getting better. But things right. are good. Things could be worse. <laughs> yeah, things could be, you know, it could have been worse. So yeah. there is this concept of toxic positivity where we feel that we have to pretend to be happy all the time mm -hmm. and be happy, even if that's not where we're there. So stats show that 80%, eight out of 10 employees are feeling high stress at work. A lot of them are burnt out. Eight out of 10 are reporting one mental health symptom at work. So 
somehow we're always surrounded by exceptions though, right? Like the people that we're surrounded by, we never admit to ourselves like, oh, eight out of 10 of these people might be struggling with something. Yeah. And we don't have that opportunity to safely share that, you know what, I'm struggling with something. Mm -hmm. Especially after the pandemic, and this is not about complaining and venting because, I, and that's where I think that's what the fear is that how do you not turn this into like create a safe space and not turn this into a complaint session and venting right. session and burden other people. So there are techniques to be able to do that. Especially after the pandemic though, we have to acknowledge people, we are, people just went through a life and death situation for two years. We were, people lost loved ones. We were not able to see our loved ones if they were international. I know I, I lost loved ones internationally, not able to see them when that happened, um, had health issues, were scared for our lives and stuck inside a house. Like, that's insane. Yeah. And yet we go back and, like, pretend we're back to normal. Like, let's go to what is the most important thing to do at work today? Um, <laughs> so that is what toxic positivity to me is, is not being able to be real mm -hmm. and and some of it comes with learning the skills of sharing and listening to people by creating that safe space in a way where both, again, we can be real, but it's not detrimental. Right. And this, this is a really nice segue into a topic that has become very popular on social media, um, in the U.S. at least, this concept of quiet quitting. Right. We're seeing all these conversations around exactly what you're talking about. Um, employees in the workplace feeling exhausted and burnt out, stress, experiencing stress on a daily basis at work and making the conscious decision to essentially do the bare minimum to just get get what needs to be done done today and and not stressing about all the other things that need to get done. Um, I mean, there's more to it, but I wanted to talk with you to see about how you think Quimby fits into the conversation around quiet quitting and what is your perspective on that? What's your take? Because I know there's two sides to it and I just want to dive in and see how you think Quimby is um, addressing the, the burnout or has the potential to address that burnout that employees are feeling and how it, you know, is a part of this conversation and quiet quitting. Um, when I think about quiet quitting, I feel it's a very complicated um, sin like situation and it's not just a one thing is happening, right? Yeah. Different people are in different boats. Yeah. So I'll hit a few things that I feel are contributing to it. First and foremost is people, again, going back to pandemic, we reevaluated our lives and we're like, is work the most important thing? Right. So the way things were working before and we were just doing things before because that's what we've been conditioned to do. A lot of people took a step back and went like, is work the most important thing? Why should I do more? Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm getting away with it. So there's a misalignment in goals, I would say, for a certain sector. And it's not, I don't think that's wrong. It's just people questioning, like, is this the best way for me to spend my life? Right. And this is where, like, this is this has been known already, is people mm -hmm. perform the best when they have a high purpose, where, like, a lot of conscious ventures and companies that are wanting to do good are, you know, you're seeing more and more in that space because people want to spend their time doing things that are, you know, good for humanity. So companies that are aligning on bigger purpose, bigger visions, bigger missions, um, you're motivating employees to spend their time doing something which is value, which they perceive as valuable too beyond just money. Yeah. So I think like there's parts of that, especially I think with Gen Z and the newer generation, there is more recognition of like, like, like asking the question, why, why should I be doing this? What is in it? Um, for the world, there's a higher consciousness around that. Then there's the element of, okay, even if there is alignment on goals and we're doing the right things, am I capable of doing the things? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is burnout and just taking, you know, I'm just not there yet. Like I'm so burnt out that I feel overwhelmed that I can't do more than what I'm doing right now. And how do we support those people right. looks different than the people who are not burnt out, aligned with the purpose, but are like, the way this is happening is not good. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't agree with it. And okay. either they're not heard 
or they're just not feeling comfortable raising their voice and speaking up. And then they go, but I'm just, you know, I'm going to like, think about it when you're with a friend and you're telling them the same thing and you're like, they're not hearing me. I'm just going to shut up. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's very similar to that. If they're like, I care about these goals, I can do something, but you're not letting me because either I don't have the autonomy or I'm not, my ideas are not being heard. That's where psychological safety comes in. Like, right. Right. People I'm working with me are just being, then I'm not going to engage. So it, I, I think there are multiple things going on with quiet quitting and it's not just a w- one size fits all. Absolutely. And now I'm talking about how Quimby fits yeah. in. Um, so great resignation, quiet quitting, all of these I say are symptoms. Mm-hmm. They're symptoms of a very similar thing, right? At the bottom line, your employees are feeling disengaged. Um, some are like, I'm going to quit and go to another company when they have the option. Some are like, I'm just not going to work. So (laughs) the employees are feeling disengaged. And how do we solve for that? And how do we increase employee engagement? And Quimby does address that. Um, The way we address that today is we've actually, with our current pilots as well, we've seen this, is first and foremost, what is not said is not solved. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, you don't know, you can't solve for it as leadership. And employee engagement surveys, there's a lot of issues with that. We all know that. <laughs> yeah. so we create safe spaces for people to share and get used to sharing. We give them the skills. Uh, we have um, psychologist design trainings where we're giving people the skills to talk about how they are feeling, how they're feeling day to day, both surface the good and the bad so that we can pro- productively talk about it. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing that we're doing is making people more aware of how they're actually doing and helping them learn emotional resilience. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you you teach people these skills so they can manage their emotions better. We're adults. Like, hey, my manager, please make me happy. Isn't the best scenario to be in. I want to be able to make myself happy and I want you to create a conducive environment for that. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're facilitating these um, we also track trends, so early indicators of burnout. And then if we notice certain trends, like tired showing up a lot, then we do more scientific interventions on burnout, um, in which case then we can tell you like, hey, this population is like this percentage of population is feeling burnt out and there needs to be a, a bigger intervention. So it's very yeah. data informed decisions and, and personalized to people. I, I- I love the data that Quimby produces for individuals and for teams, because you mentioned earlier being able to track your own wellness using the Quimby app and being able to see when you're having those peaks and valleys and being able to adjust for yourself, um, you know, by tracking those things that you're doing that make you feel good or, you know, have you feeling low. Um, And I really especially love the fact that it is data driven because emotions and well-being are these, you know, um, things that are intangible and are sometimes hard to measure and are oftentimes kind of relegated into their own world and not a part of like um, quantitative data collection. Right. And so I think Quimby is doing a really cool thing by making it in and actually producing data that can be turned into um, that, that can be used to create a strategy for creating a safer space in the workplace. Yeah. Um, we hear this a lot. Um, I'm just not an emotions person and um, I don't bring emotions to work. I like to keep them separate. And I, I think I understand what people are trying to say. So no judgment there is like th- we have all the conditioning that we have. Right. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we're less comfortable sharing and we like to compartmentalize, which is which is not a bad thing. Not everybody's right. able to. Um, sometimes it makes you more effective. But that's a choice and an intention. And I'm good with whatever choice people make. But at the minimum, I would hope that everybody understands that emotions are nothing but hormones and chemicals and neurons firing in your body. And there is no way to keep them at home. They come okay. with it's a package. It's kind of a package yeah. deal. So you're feeling them and they're feeding your mind. And uh, like, if you really look at the um, the way emotions and your mind works and, and, and the pathways, it is feeding thoughts to your mind. So whatever your thoughts are, they're very, and your behaviors and emotions are all very strongly correlated. So just acknowledging that, you know what, this is what's happening. Even if you don't want to address this is okay. But th- there is like, it, as long as there's education behind it, that 
that's present. Like it's not a foo foo thing right. that you leave outside because it's in your brain, right? right. It's like exactly. hormones wearing hormones. Yeah, it's not a mystical thing that, yeah. I, exactly. I talking yeah. about the way that emotions feed thoughts. Can you just drop that statistic on how many thoughts we have per day? Oh yeah, so um, there are different studies on that, but the latest study says 6,000. 6,000 thoughts a day. 6,000 thoughts a day. And they're all, you know, leading us to, to feel a certain way, to behave a certain way, right? And they're feeding other thoughts and we're going down rabbit holes all the time. Exactly. <laughs> so, and I think that Quimby is a great intervention because of how it interrupts you in your day. Well, not, it, it kind of interrupts those thoughts and has you check in with yourself at multiple points throughout the day so that you can see where, you know, at what times of the day are you having these thoughts that are distracting you from your work or where you're feeling um, unmotivated or tired or, you know, whatever the feelings are. Um, I just think it's so cool. And I love that managers are able to see this data from their teams and, you know, make a plan of action to support their teams. Yeah. Amazing. We, we share the aggregate insights with the entire team so people know that they're not alone and they can proactively address it with their teams as well. But yeah, Naisha, we should hire you for marketing. <laughs> You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to. I love it. I love what y'all are doing. And I know you have some really exciting things going on with Quimby these days. So tell us what's happening. Tell us all the exciting things that you've been working on and what you have coming up. Yeah, we have been working with customers, uh, companies from startups to Fortune 500. We've been um getting pilots, paid customers. So if anybody who's interested in creating psychological safety, building emotional resilience with their teams and really building an emotional connection and having those real conversations on beyond just like a higher level employee engagement, like what's happening, how are people feeling? Please sign up for early access. We're really excited to work with companies and managers like that. Um, teams of, whether it's a team of 10 to a team of 50, all good, we can handle that. And then on the other end, we're really excited to see the results. We have over 80% of employees sign up for our pilots. Uh -huh. our, uh, we had an untraditionally really high NPS in our latest pilot above, above 38. And then, which is for an early stage company, really good. We're really excited to see our active usage is really high compared to other platforms. Nice. So we're seeing really positive indicators and managers are our champions. Um, and most importantly, we're getting feedback that it's helping people all the way from it's helping somebody track their emotions for who has a bipolar disorder and taking it to their doctor to like, just remembering, like, I'm a human, I'm working like, Hey, it's, it's helping me check in with myself and manage my emotions better and be more effective at work. So we're, we're loving hearing all sorts of feedback on that. Um, and then on the other hand, we just started our friends and family round. So this is our first round we've been bootstrapping so far. Okay. And we have our first investors in. We'll be closing this round in October. So if anybody's Amazing. interested, hit, hit us up. Yeah, That is so exciting, Samita. Ah, I, I love that. And I want to make sure that people know how to connect with you after this. So um, just we have your website, quimbyapp.com, but you also can connect with Samita on LinkedIn, send her a DM, get her email, and figure out how you and your team can either get onboarded with Quimby or how you can support Quimby in the future. Um, so exciting and, and super timely. Um, Monday, October 10th is actually World Mental Health Day, I just learned. So timely discussion. Um, I hope that viewers watching this really take some time to think about how they're um, showing up at work, showing up for themselves, mentally, emotionally, and how they're, um, you know, making time to, to take care of their mental well-being, um, especially those who are entrepreneurs, because um, I know that journey is not an easy one. Yeah. Um, and speaking of journey, um, Samaita, I just wanted to close out with one word from you to describe where you're at in your founder journey right now and really how you're feeling about it. One word. One word. One word or a phrase. It can be a phrase. It's the way the, the thing that occurs to me is it's all happening exactly how it's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And I will say we're going in the right direction and we're seeing 
really good positive indicators uh, leading us there. So we're really excited. Yes, I love that. It's all one happening supposed to. One word, grateful. Love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Sumeda. I could talk to you way longer than this 30 minutes that we have for this interview. We may just have to bring you back to talk more. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. If you don't already follow us on Instagram and Twitter, please do that and be sure to connect with Sumeda offline on LinkedIn um, or through email. Thanks so much. See you all thank next you, time. Aisha. Yes.